So we'll give people a chance to arrive, but while other people are making their way in, we just want to say welcome to the Center for Spiritual Deepening and to this evening's event with Dana Green, who will share with us her um, what she knows and wants to share with us about the life and wisdom of Evelyn Underhill. We're especially excited to have you with us. We see some from our own community, but we know that many of you are coming to us through an invitation that Dana shared through the Evelyn Underhill Society. So it's nice to have, um, to have new folks with us, faces we haven't seen before. If you're new to us and would like to know more about the center, if you'd like to receive occasional uh, mailings to know what we're up to, you can always send us an email at info at centerforspiritualdeepening.org or you can find us um, on the internet as well. Announcements for what's coming up. If you're local, the next thing that will happen at the center on May 8th is on the grounds of St. Aidan's, since we can be outside and that's a good thing. On the grounds of St. Aidan's on May 8th, we're going to do a morning of remembrance, blessing and thanksgiving that will incorporate some music, some poetry, some silence, some time to walk the labyrinth and to appreciate the grounds of St. Aidan's. So we hope you'll join us for that if you're close by. And that's kind of what's coming up. Logistics for this evening, Russ has kind of shared. We do record our sessions, so be aware that that um, is happening. And if you know somebody who hasn't been able to join us tonight or who misses us for some reason, you'll eventually be able to go to the website and find the recording there. We do ask you to stay muted when you're not speaking or when you're not in your breakout group, just because we all know how that controls noise and makes things better for everyone. We will, so Dana will share her presentation when she um, is done with that part of the evening. We'll see if we have any questions and then Russ will help us go into smaller groups to look at some, some quotes, some of the words of Evelyn Underhill and share our thoughts and reflections on those. And I think that's all we need to know before we can start. And so I give you Dana Green, who is the author of a biography on Evelyn Underhill the editor of two anthologies of Underhill's writings and a longtime friend and supporter of the Center for Spiritual Deepening. So welcome, Dana. Okay, um, Lisa, um, were you going to read the quote from Wisdom? I forgot, am I gonna do it or is Russ gonna do it? I've got it here, right here. Thank you. Although alone, wisdom can do all, herself unchanging. She makes all things new. In each generation, she passes into holy soul. She makes them friends of God and prophets. For God loves only the man who lives with wisdom. She is indeed more splendid than the sun. She outshines all the constellations. Compared with light, she takes first place, for light must yield to night. But over wisdom, evil can never triumph. She deploys her strength from one end of the earth to the other, ordering all things for good. So I'm delighted to be here with you this evening and to share this life and work of a person who's meant so much to me over the course of many years. But first, I want to thank Lisa and Peg and Russ for their help in making this evening possible. The reading we heard from the Book of Wisdom is read every year in the Anglican, Episcopal, and Lutheran churches on Evelyn Underhill's feast day, the day she died, June 15th, 2021, as I said before, is the 80th anniversary of her death. She died in 1941. The reading, I think, is appropriate. In each generation, wisdom passes into holy souls making them friends of God and prophets. This is a great promise. The holy souls will appear in our time as they did in the past. I think Evelyn Underhill is one of those holy souls. 
Michael Ramsey, the former Archbishop of Canterbury said that <clears throat> Underhill did more than anyone else to keep the spiritual life alive in the Anglican church in the period between the wars. William Stringfellow, theologian and social activist, claimed that every life is inherently theological, since by virtue of the incarnation, every life contains news of the gospel. Each of us is a parable. My claim is that Evelyn Underhill's life is an important parable. And the journalist uh, Keith Woodward suggests that a life is a kind of primary theology, an example of ongoing revelation, and hence it can inspire and challenge us to critical self-examination. Now, who is Evelyn Underhill? Some have called her a modern mystic, a religious writer, a Christian philosopher, a contemplative and ecumenist, None of these designations is correct, but each has its limitations. In my biography of Underhill, I called her artist of the infinite life. Um, Lisa, can you put up uh, a shot of the biography? and you can take it down. I can remember when it first dawned on me what Underhill's contribution was. I was in the venerable Blackwell's bookstore in Oxford, England, when across the room, I saw a sign for the used book section, which was divided into different subject areas. My eyes lighted on the sign that said, secondhand theology, and I burst out laughing because I knew that that was the correct de designation for so much of theology, at least as I had experienced it, abstract, remote, disconnected from life, hence used up and barren, in short, secondhand. The power of Underhill's writing is rather that it captures firsthand theology the raw experience of the personal encounter with God. It is this subject, this firsthand primary theology that defines the importance of her contribution. Her genius was that she even sought out this subject at all, a subject which had been buried for at least three pre previous centuries. Her first subject was mysticism a much misunderstood and maligned phenomenon. Another reminiscence. When I was in London doing research on this biography, I went into another bookstore to seek out in which category Underhill's book on mysticism would be shelved. There it was under the heading magic right along with tarot cards and the healing power of crystals, I wanted to weep at this mischaracterization. Evelyn Underhill's achievement was notable and she was acclaimed in her own times. She was author or editor of 39 books, 350 articles and reviews, a pioneer in the retreat movement in the 1920s and 30s, in the Church of England, and an early spiritual director, which in her day was called the Care of Souls. Um, Lisa, can you put up the next photo of um, Underhill sitting at the Pleshy Retreat Center, um, offering spiritual, what we call spiritual direction? So she gave a retreat for Anglican clergy uh, concerning the inner life and was the first woman to offer a retreat in Canterbury Cathedral. She was also the first female outside lecturer at Oxford University. She was named a fellow of King's College London 
and awarded a doctorate of divinity degree by the University of Aberdeen. Now, she was neither a cleric nor a nun, but a married lay woman living in Kensington, a very upscale section of London. She had no formal theological training. She had studied botany, drawing, history, and languages at what then was called the ladies department of King's College. I always think of lingerie when I say that name, but the ladies department of King's College was the continuing education for ladies who were not yet admitted to universities. What is really remarkable is the subject matter she reclaimed, mysticism. During her time, religious writers focused on scripture, social action, church history, theology, but not on the direct human relationship with the divine, what the mystics claimed. If prayer were studied, it was the formal prayer of the church. In the early 20th century, when Underhill began writing in earnest, the topic of mysticism was almost unheard of, particularly in the Protestant traditions. As a woman, she was marginalized, but so was her topic. In our time together, I'd like to focus briefly on four areas, the religious context of her time, the important changes in her life, her fundamental ideas, and what Underhill can mean for us today. She was an only child born into the professional class of England in 1875. So she's a Victorian and an Edwardian, and sometimes her language is the language of those periods. <clears throat> she was raised in the staid Anglican church, baptized and confirmed, but her per parents were not religious, really. They were basically deists. Early in her life, she found religion boring and she ridiculed it. Uh, Lisa, can you put up the photo of the young Evelyn Underhill? Okay. Now, Anglicanism provided none of the spiritual vitality she wanted. Where she saw that religious vitality was in the art, architecture, and ritual, which she discovered in her 16 trips to Italy. She called Italy the holy land of Europe, the only place left that is really medicinal to the soul. She said there was a, a type of mind which had to go there to find itself. What attracted her was the beauty of the landscape and the art. Beauty, she believed, was the visual side of goodness. She also found vitality in the spiritual groups, spiritualist groups that were forming in London at the turn of the century. In fact, she participated in one of those groups, the Golden Dawn, with its secretive rituals and magic practices. But she soon encountered the barrenness of the world of the occult. Her early writing projects were fiction. She published three novels and two books of poetry. She was seen as a lady scribbler of an otherworldly bent. But a friend who was the keeper of manuscripts at the British Library introduced her to the library's medieval materials. At this point, there were no books accessible to the ordinary person on medieval mystics. Unlike today, when the classical medieval mystical writers are now on the shelves of bookstores or readily available at a click from Amazon, they were not available in the early 1900s. Access to the mystics was in archives and their writing was in various languages. And worse was that mysticism was suspect and seen as irrational at best. The year 1907 
was pivotal for her. Early in the year, she made a retreat at the Franciscan convent, but left after the fourth day, fearful that she might convert to Catholicism on the spot. That year was also the year of her marriage. She was 32. Let's see uh, the next photo of the lovely Evelyn Underhill. Could we see that, Lisa? She's a lovely woman. She was 32 and when she married, she would move to Campton Hill Square in Kensington, one block from where she grew up and from her parents' home. Let's have, a, let's have the photo of her house. You can go to this house today. I mean, I did, I knocked on the door and the people let me in. Um, the plaque on the house um, defines her as a Christian philosopher, you know not totally wrong, but not totally right either. When she announced to her future husband, Hubert Stuart Moore, who was a deist and anti-clerical barrister, that she wanted to convert to Catholicism, he put his foot down. He could not have a wife confessing to another man. So she decided to wait for a year, hoping he might come round. But that very same year, the very conservative Roman Catholic Pope issued an encyclical condemning what was called modernism. That is the use of scientific and historical methods to critique religion and scripture. Since Underhill considered herself a modernist, she realized she could not convert. She said she could no longer walk the muddy path to Rome. She chose to live outside institutional religion on what I have called the borderland. She directed all of her considerable energies beginning in 1907 to writing her massive book, Mysticism. And the subtitle is so interesting. The subtitle is A Study of the Nature and Development of Man's Spiritual Consciousness. Um, there's a photo there of that book. Um, if you would put that up, Lisa. Okay. Oh, well, we'll leave it up for a minute. It was a fat book. 500 pages based on a thousand sources and published in 1911. It's not the first book you wanna read if you're reading uh, Underhill as a beginner. It's never been out of print in the last 110 years. In it, Underhill wrote to both define mysticism, separate it from magic and current philosophical systems to articulate the various stages of the mystic life and to save the contribution of the mystics over the centuries, those she called the great pioneers of higher human consciousness, those who had experienced a transcendent reality which transfigured their lives. Underhill wanted to preserve their writings and their lives. One of her contributions was to detail the stages of, the, of mystic development, which traditionally had been defined as three, what's called purgation or purification, illumination and union. Underhill in her genius added an initial stage of what was called awakening. This was a positive stage of responding to beauty or goodness or truth. So the process begins positively and then moves on to purgation, illumination. And then she also added a fourth stage, what 
what she called and borrowed from John of the Cross, the dark night of the soul, where the great mystics were stripped of all consolation, preparing them to enter into union with God. Underhill believed that while every person has the capacity for God, what she called the little buried talent, it's a wonderful phrase, a little buried talent that has to be excavated really. The mystic has a genius for this, a passion for this capacity for God. The Christian mystic, she claimed, aim their lives at union with God. She dismissed the notion that visions and voices, while present sometimes in the mystic life, that they were not central to mysticism. What was central was the mystics increasing and overwhelming certainty of the firsthand experience of the love of God penetrating and changing them. The mystics were, she said, those who knew for certain the love of God. It's a wonderful phrase. They knew for certain the love of God. She insisted that the experience of the love of God was accessible to every person. And she expressed this in another little book with the interesting title, Practical Mysticism for Normal People. That's us, normal people. Normal people and mystics are on a continuum. They're different, not in kind, but in degree. During the next several years, Underhill finished her book on mysticism and wrote on individual mystics and edited mystic text. She wrote, agreeing with Teresa of Avila, that the best way to know God was to frequent the company of God's friends. And you do that through reading about their lives and their texts. But her own spiritual life was growing very thin. This is in the second decade of the 20th century. She was not a Catholic nor a practicing Anglican. She had no one to discuss or guide her. She later wrote that during this time, she became increasingly anti-institutional and drifted towards an inwardness. The historical context was grim too. In 1917, the great war ended. She had supported the war, but its devastation for her and for everyone was overwhelming. Two of her cousins had been killed in the war and at the same time, her dearest friend died and the Russian revolution began. And during this time, she wrote, and this is really the only testimony we have of her now, this little phrase from this period. During this time, she wrote the cryptic words, I went to pieces. She was lost and said her life was plated with pain. Her writing during the wartime had been largely biographies of mystics and the editing of their texts. Some of this writing came to focus on the Franciscan tradition. She wrote on the 13th century mystic, Angelo de Foligno, and most importantly, on Jacopone de Tode. Um, these are two towns, Foligno and Tode in Umbria, where Francis, the generation before, had evangelized. Jacopone was a 13th century poet and mystic and a second generation Franciscan who worked to purify the Franciscan order and got caught up in condemnation of the papacy for which he was incarcerated and suffered tremendously. When a new Pope ascended, Jacopone was released from prison. Underhill found in Jacopone a deep sense of Franciscan incarnationalism. And he, like Angela, were, were, he was mediator between 
their experience of the love of God and others. They overcame detachment from the world and came to love it. For Underhill, the Franciscans, with their emphasis on poverty, had an immediate apprehension of transcendent reality. And as she said, they erected no fences between the natural and the supernatural. This was a great consolation for a woman who had become abstracted herself and preoccupied with escape from reality to the transcendent. Her life of Jacopone de Tode was published in 1919. It is the lone biography of this man. It was of course written in English and only in 2018, it was published in Italian by a friend of mine, Claudio Pere of Tode. And I don't know if you can see it, but this is Claudio's translation of uh, the, the life of the mystic poet uh, Jacopone. During this same period, Underhill met a former Franciscan Catholic nun, Sorella, Sorella means sister, Sorella Maria, who would go on to found in Umbria an ecumenical community of women seekers who prayed and practiced the presence of God. Underhill visited this woman and her community and corresponded with her. Underhill's intellectual engagement, engagement with Jacoponi and the personal engagement with Sorella Maria gave her a reprieve from the abstracted mysticism she realized how diminished her own spiritual life had become. In a state of great need, she made two decisions. <clears throat> she reluctantly slipped back into the Anglican church and she sought out a spiritual director, Maren Friedrich von Hugel, a Roman Catholic layman living in England and a modernist with whom she could share her plight. She had five years of counsel from him. He urged her to work with the poor and take pleasure in ordinary English life, which she did, gardening, yachting, bookbinding, and her cats, all very English things. It was von Hugel who asserted that vibrant Christianity had three components, an intellectual component, namely theology, an institutional component, namely the church, uh, whose work was to protect and carry on uh, and spread the great spiritual resources, and an experiential component, the personal experience of God, expressed in mysticism, but available to everyone. It was this final element mysticism, which was lacking in Anglicanism, Anglicanism at this time. 1921 was a pivotal moment for her, a fulcrum on which her life would turn. As she wrote, I love this quote. <clears throat> I love all these quotes that I'm going to give you. Now the experience of God is, I believe, in the long run, always a vocational experience. It always impels to some sort of service, always awakens an energetic love. It never leaves the self where it found it. It is at this point Underhill left her scholarly study of mysticism and began a new vocation of developing retreats and offering the care of souls. It was this work that made it possible for her to remain in the Anglican church. She found work there that she could do. Um, Lisa, can you bring up Evelyn Underhill at the retreat center in Pleshi? She's got a little white cap on. She never explains what that cap is. 
Um, so we'd have to guess. <clears throat> but there she is at, the, at her favorite retreat center. She had great apprehension about this new work and whether she was worthy to do it. She wrote in her diary, in my lucid moments, I see only too clearly that the possible end of this road is complete unconditional self-consecration. And for this, I have not the nerve, the character or the depth. There's been some sort of mistake. My soul is too small for it. And yet at bottom, the only thing that I really want. It feels sometimes as if while still a jumble of conflicting impulses and violent thoughts and faults, I'm being pushed from behind towards an edge I dare not jump, jump over. Well, she did jump. Each year, she would prepare a retreat and travel around to England like a circuit rider, taking the train all over, delivering the true retreat and offering spiritual counsel to those who attended. Most of them were principally women. Um, if Lisa, could you put up that photo we called Sweet Evelyn Underhill? She looks like somebody you'd go to for spiritual counsel. Her favorite retreat house was in the, villa, uh, the village of Pleshy. You can go there. It's, it's a wonderful place. Um, and it's, she's commemorated every year there in June. Um, and it is the retreat house of Pleshy, which is um, helping us going to, to helping us to celebrate this um, 80th year of her death. <clears throat> her new vocation did two things. It allowed her to remain in the Anglican church because it meant she could do something to revitalize the church. And it meant she could encourage the spiritual life of ordinary people. This was pioneering work. In the 1920s and 30s, the retreat movement was a totally new development in the Church of England and meant to foster the expanding spiritual consciousness of all Christians. The purpose of the retreat and spiritual council was to strengthen the spiritual life and invigorate the church. She wrote, true mysticism is the soul of religion and like the soul of man, it needs a body if it is to fulfill its mighty destiny. Divorced from all institutional expression, mysticism tends to become strange and vague or merely sentimental. That was certainly her experience. But this is an ongoing question. I mean, we hear everywhere, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. She's making the argument that these two belong together. And I think it speaks to the work of St. Aidan's Center for Spiritual Deepening. It's embedded in the institutional church to deepen the life of uh, its congregation. In a brilliant BBC broadcast in the 1960s called The Spiritual Life, and I must say that if you're a beginner, uh, in reading Underhill. I think the spiritual life or the letters might be the place to begin. But in this broad, it was delivered first orally. So it made, makes it quite accessible. Underhill defined the spiritual life. Pay attention to this quote. It is brilliant, I think. She says that the spiritual life is a life in which all that we do comes from the center where we are anchored in God. She was a yachtswoman um, and she loved to sail. This may explain the use of the verb to anchor. But the point is that the spiritual life requires an attachment to God 
at the very center of our being. The genius of this definition is that it speaks of the priority of God and the integrated wholeness that results from that anchoring, that attachment. So the spiritual life is the whole of life. It's not some little devotional patch out there, you know, that we carry on independent from life. It, the spiritual life is the totality of life and it comes, it's possible if we can act from this center where we are attached to God, which of course comes from prayer. In other writing, she again democratizes holiness, offering the possibility to ordinary people. This is another quote. The final test of holiness is not seeming very different from other people, but being used to make other people very different, becoming a parent of new life. Again, it's ordinary people leading ordinary lives, which can lead to a life of holiness. And in homey and accessible language, she described those holy ones as those who, quote, they do not stand around wrapped in delightful prayers and feeling pure and agreeable to God. They go right down into the mess and they are right in the mess, they are able to radiate God because they possess God. And that above all else is the priestly work that wins and hears souls. So she is saying that, uh, that it's, it's, a, it's a quote that is paired with this, what the spiritual life is. The spiritual life is all of our actions come from the center where we attached, we're anchored in God. And that's what holy ones can do. They can go right down into the mess and they're able to radiate God because they are attached to God. Could Lisa, can we see that icon of Underhill? Um, Around the edges of the icon is written, God comes to the soul in his working clothes and he brings his tools with him. Um, this is a contemporary icon done by a iconographer in New Jersey. <clears throat> I might also add that um, there's a statue of Underhill on the, the main facade of the Guilford Cathedral in, um, in the UK. <clears throat> anyway, Underhill believed the promise of the Book of Wisdom. There are friends of God among us. She offered a way to recognize them. She wrote, and this is, again is a wonderful quote. <laughs> Oh, we must, we most easily recognize spirituality, reality, when it is perceived transfiguring human character. The spiritual life is not taught, it's caught. One gets it through contagion, through individuals, through communities. The spiritual life is not taught, it's caught one gets it through contagion. The spiritual life was not some narrow disembodied life, but rather the apex of a full humanity. Above all, the mystics knew this. What are the qualities of the spiritual life which we recognize in the transfigured human character? She says they are tranquility, gentleness, courage, and service. It's a life which responds, here I am, send me. It is the person who is filled with the love of God who teaches not through speech, 
but through their being, through their presence. They ignite new life in those who know them. It was prayer, Underhill suggested, which ignited the latent capacity for God. That little buried treasure or talent that each of us has and which is only ignited when once ignited, the person becomes a link between God's grace and a world that needs healing. Now, these two parts of Underhill's life are not separate. Her study of the mystics and her pioneering work in advancing the spiritual life for ordinary people are not separate events, but are intimately tied together. The 20 years she spent in the company of the mystics made it possible for her to translate that knowledge to ordinary people. As her friend, the poet T.S. Eliot claimed, Underhill was conscious of the grievous need of the contemplative element in the modern world. And it was that need which she attempted to meet. In her last years, Underhill withdrew from retreat work and she produced a bookend to her original work on mysticism. This was a book called Worship published in 1935 in which she defined the elements of worship and in an extraordinary ecumenical effort, effort examined the various Western religious traditions from Judaism, Orthodox Christianity, Roman Catholicism, and each of the Protestant uh, traditions of worship from Quakerism to Anglicanism. In this, she showed the distinctive differences of it, of each of these, and what that worship tra tradition offered. Each tradition arose at a different historical time, and each had its own genius. She devised for these various traditions a memorable metaphor. She said, each tradition was a chapel in the cathedral of the spirit. A chapel in the cathedral of the spirit, each different, but each incorporated in that cathedral of the spirit. Before it was fashionable, Evelyn Underhill was an ecumenist. Think about how separate and class bound the various Christian denominations were in Britain in the 1930s. Each had meaning, she says, and a purpose which enriched the human attempts at worship. But even more important and more revealing was her commitment to a Christianity, which was a complete integrated philosophy of existence rather than some mere devotional expression. At the height of her powers, Underhill had no concept of her final vocation. Rather, the final vocation was thrust on her by the coming of the Second World War. In the late 1930s, as Sudetenland and Poland fell to the Nazis, she joined the Peace Pledge Union and the Anglican Pacifist Fellowship. This was a real act of courage. At this point, she was the fair haired girl of the Anglicans praised by universities and ecclesiastical officials. Her book sold well. There were very few pacifists in England, almost all of whom were members of the historic peace churches, the Mennonites and Quakers. The Church of England specifically denounced the pacifist position and many friends pulled away from her. Her view was that pacifism was a position rooted in the faith that love was the ultimate reality and would prevail. To be a pacifist was a vocation given by God, and she understood that not everyone had that vocation. Although she was unable to offer an alternative to war, her vocation was to strengthen others in those very dark times. As the Blitz dragged on in 1940 and London experienced great devastation, blackouts, food shortages, bombing of homes, historic buildings, and the tube, 
she remained steadfast, attempting to study, steady the lives of others. She was clear, evil could not be defeated by evil. Since the churches were spiritually impoverished and incapable of offering guidance, her hope was that, that quote, the new life when it comes will well up from the deepest sources of prayer. She urged her followers to see the world, to see even the enemy with the eyes of God. She wrote, and here again <laughs> is a wonderful image. She says, the aim of prayer is to stand alongside the generous creative love, that's God, maker of all things visible and invisible including those we do not like and see them with the eyes of the artist lover. So it's possible for us to see even those who may be enemy with the mercy of God. These two movements being anchored in God and acting from that, and the second to stand beside the creative creator in prayer and see as God sees, two important movements. In the first months of 1941, her asthma became more severe as the bombs rained down on London and she died in June 15, 1941 and is buried in Hampstead Parish Church. Uh, Lisa, can you bring up the photo of her grave? There it is. Her gravestone says, Hubert Stuart Moore, who died several years after she did, and his wife, Evelyn. The, the Brits would say Evelyn. I always say when I'm here in this country, I say Evelyn. Hubert Stuart Moore and his wife, Evelyn, daughter of Saint uh, of Arthur Underhill. She was defined by the men in her life. When I first saw this, I was appalled. But the good news is that there is a campaign going on right this very moment uh, uh, organized by Hampstead Parish Church to add a piece to that stone, which gives her name, Evelyn Underhill, which is very exciting development. So this is the life and work of this remarkable woman. What is her meaning for us living almost a century after her death? Underhill reclaimed the mystic tradition and redefined it. Mystics are those who know for certain the love of God. Long before the German theologian Karl Reiner, Karl Rahner prophesied that, quote, the Christian of the future will be a mystic or he will not exist at all. Evelyn Underhill had announced the importance of the mystical tradition in the past and it's imperative for future Christians. She nurtured the spiritual life of her contemporaries and left her writings to nurture us, mapping out the implications of what it is to be a Christian. Namely, the love of God transforms and leads to service of others, to seeing in a new way. Underhill, redefined religion and what it meant to be religious, a religious person. It was the personal experience of the love of God which gave authenticity and authority to the person. Having been loved by God, one is free to love others, even the unlovable, even the enemy. The love of God is transformative and caused what she referred to as divine fecundity, the birthing of new life. This is the central message of Christianity, but Underhill reinterprets it as a lay woman 
for the 20th and 21st centuries. So if you'd like to learn more about Underhill, you can go to the website of the Evelyn Underhill Association, uh, www.evelynunderhill.org. And since this is the 80th anniversary of her death, the retreat house in Pleshy, the Diocese of Chelmsford, and the Evelyn Underhill Association USA are joining together to celebrate her life and work in a week-long celebration beginning on Monday, June 14th. You can find out more about this soon on the website. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being um, interested in Evelyn Underhill. And I hope um, you can mine her great, her great riches. Thank you. Dana, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I already am ready for the recording to come back so that I can go and listen all over again, start to finish. <laughs> so what we'd love to do, if you're willing to take a few minutes, Dana, yeah. we, do, um, we wanna share some, some, a few of the quotes that Dana shared with us. You may remember others of your own. So we do in a few minutes wanna take those into smaller groups so people can have discussions and reflections on just what they're carrying away from. Um, from what is what has touched you in this time. But before we do that, if anybody has questions that they'd like to ask Dana now, either you can put them in the chat if you'd rather not speak up, or if you have a question, you could also just unmute yourself and ask it that way. Dana, did Evelyn have any favorite mystics that she quoted? Well, she initially uh, she loved risebrook the uh, the dutch uh, mystic but then she really moved to love jacopone de tode um this friend's second generation poet and mystic um so those were the two that she but you know you can if you want to dive in phil to the um mysticism she's she quotes many i mean that's part of her genius she's she can pick out apt quotations um uh, uh you know just very very easily Thank you. i think bonnie just put up a a question about christopher armstrong who uh, there are three biographies uh, mine is the last. Uh, the first one was by Margaret Cropper, who was a contemporary of Underhill. And then the second one, and I'm forgetting the published date now, was by an Anglican clergyman, Christopher Armstrong, who I met in um, doing the book. The, his book, he ran out of time in his book. Um, he, uh, uh, the first part of the book is excellent. He goes into the earlier life of uh, Underhill, uh, talks about her engagement with the Golden Dawn and the early part, but he ran out of time and the end of the book is it's much thinner, but the her first part of the book is very rich. Any other questions? I see we're getting a question with the last name Thompson, and but we can't hear you. We just need you to unmute. Yeah, Uberwaga, Thompson Uberwaga. I knew I wasn't uh, going to do that right. Oh, why not? <laughs> <laughs> um, when you read studies of her, they talk about um, the role of Jesus in her spirituality. Mm -hmm. And you talk about this a little bit too. And uh, I think uh, Von, Hugel, Von Hugel also yes. had some issues about this. Could you say something about that and what you think about that whole discussion? Well, you know, I make the point that um, 
obviously she's a Christian. She, she values Jesus as a model for living. But I say she is really spirit-centered. Um, and not to diminish, um, not to di diminish Jesus, but she puts the emphasis on the spirit. And it, it's a very futuristic uh, uh, way of proceeding, I think, that the spirit is here, the spirit is guiding humanity. And um, so I, I say she isn't really as Christocentric as some people would maybe want her to be. She certainly is a Christian. There's no doubt about that. But the emphasis is is different. <clears throat> For instance, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> when she talks about the various uh, worship ritual traditions in worship, she talks about them each being chapels in the cathedral of the spirit, you know, each of these creations that humans have devised are part of this larger. Uh, and of course, because I think she began, you know, she began sort of abstracted. She was very, um, well, she wasn't so Christocentric as you mentioned, uh, Von Hugel really helped her in that regard. And it helped, you know, her her sense of incarnationalism. Thank you for the question. Well, of course, um, the persons of the Trinity always act in concert, even though yeah. one may be a focus. Yeah. So being spirit centered doesn't mean you've ignored Christ. Uh, it's just that subjectively that's where your spirit is and where you're finding a center. And, and these things can move around in one's life. Right. There are times when one can be very Christocentric and then spirit-centered and then, uh, uh, you know, creation and uh, the eternal one centered. Right. right. Thank you, Bishop, Bishop Frank. <laughs> I, I, very well said. I think she would, she would, certainly agree. <clears throat> so I think maybe this is a good moment for us to make sure we have some time to, um, to have some small group discussion and then we can always come back together after we've done that to um, take any additional questions that might come out of our time together. How does that sound to everybody? Seem like a workable plan. So um, Russ, our Zoom wizard, We'll take a moment to um, to get us set to go into these smaller groups. Let me also, actually, let me do a couple of things. Um, I'm going to take three of the quotes that Dana has shared with us, and I'm going to put them in the chat so that what should happen when you get into your breakout room is that you should be able to see them. So those are headed your way now. And of course, if there's some other favorite quote that you managed to capture in your own notes that you want to bring into that conversation, that's, um, that's lovely too. And we'll just go when Russ is ready. Sometimes some people disappear into the ether with breakout session, sessions. Is that the case, Russ, or do we need to give people a minute to get back? Well, it looks like everybody's back at this point. So. Okay. Well, this, if, uh, if anybody has questions, thoughts, reflections that have come out of your time with friends new and old in our last few minutes with Dana, is there anything we'd like to ask or say? Well, Dana, I'd just like, like to thank you because I think this, this whole focus, her whole focus on everything flowing from God and the love of God is so important. Um, and it seems to be a theme that keeps repeating in other mysteries. Like we just did... St. Francis of Assisi's and always never cease adoring. Everything's pointed toward God and then it flows through. Um, so that was just really wonderful to hear that because it is something that all of us can experience, um, whoever we are. We can't hear you, Dana. It's the Christian message, you know, 
Underhill is pure Christianity as far as I'm concerned, you know. So any, any Dana, Dana, would you mind sharing a little bit about how you discovered or uh, how she came into your life, Evelyn Underhill? Oh, That's well, great yeah. Um, when I was in college, so uh, maybe 18, I remember taking mysticism off the shelf and trying to read it. And it was, you know, it was impossible for me. Um, years later, um, I was teaching, I'm a historian by training, and I was teaching the senior class of history majors and they had to write a, uh, a comparative paper um, you know, on some comparative topic. And a wonderful student, um, and this was so ironic because the, the institution I was at was totally, totally secular. Um, she wanted to write a paper comparing the Rhineland mystics and the Spanish mystics. So um, I was supposed to be directing this major project that she was doing. And I said, well, you need to read Evelyn Underhill. Um, I had remembered that from <laughs> my early college days. And so I was at that point, you know, mature. <laughs> and I started reading it to help her. And the next year I had a sabbatical and I, um, I decided I was going to do uh, an edited book of some of her uh, more obscure uh, writings. And so I was hooked and I went on and wrote then the biography and then another book of her notebooks, an edited book. So, and, and that was in the 19, late 1980s and she has been, a companion ever since, really. So your students teach you things. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, I'm curious to know, you mentioned that she was interested in the spiritualists early on. Yeah. Do we know if she um, had the ability to communicate with others on who have passed on or? Did she ever write about that or share about that? No, she, she was part of what was called the Golden Dawn. And this was a big movement in London at the turn of the century, the spiritualists were, and she was young and feisty, you know. Um, she, she had some friends that were members of the Golden Dawn. And so, but no, she never writes about that. And was, was very soon, you know, wrote about how it was bankrupt. You know, it wasn't really going anywhere. She said she compared the occult and mysticism as uh, the occult wanting power and mysticism wanting love. Um, so she juxtaposed those two, those two things. Thank you. And would you say a little bit uh, about, I mean, in, the, in the notebooks, for example, you, uh, you brought forward some of her own interior struggles, yeah. which made her so much more yes. complete and full. Yeah. And I, I don't know whether you could touch on that a little bit. I, mean, be, I think people can read her and think it's also placid and and yes, humorous right. in a very right. English sort of way, but she, she really had... <laughs> Uh, some deep struggles in her own inner yes, life. She did. And I think it was about intimacy. Um, mm. uh, you know, I think she had a very sort of English marriage, very proper. And, um, and uh, you know, I think she wanted to be detached so that she could be there for others. And yet she had this great hunger for intimacy. Yeah. Actually, it's interesting that there, you know, as in so many biographies, there, there are people who want to protect people. And uh, I, in doing the biography, um, I, uh, 
I met the keeper of the at the door uh, of Underhill's uh, Agatha Norman, her name was, and um, I wanted to publish those notebooks, which showed precisely because they showed her suffering, yeah. uh, precisely because you know of what you said. Everybody thinks, oh, she's you know everything's perfect. Well, it's not. Um, yeah. And um, I had to wait till this woman died to oh, I haven't, so. the executor of the trust said, you know, just wait. Uh, she was quite elderly and she died. And then I was able to, to publish, oh, okay. which I think was a contribution precisely because of what you just said, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think it was about intimacy and yeah. me for the need for love um, yeah. of human, of human, human love. Right, exactly, exactly. I think she and Sorella uh, Maria had a, a very warm relationship yes, in that did. regard. They did, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, this last year, uh, two years ago, there was a big festival in Tode around Jacopone de Tode, and I came and gave a paper on Underhill, and that community still exists. Ah, wow. And my husband and I went out trying to find it, <laughs> speaking no Italian, and uh, was up on this mountain, and we couldn't get there. Um, I had been in touch with uh, Sorella Daniela, who was the the chief there, and she said, um, "Don't come." You know. Um, some of our sisters had been in an accident. We've had all kinds of problems. Please don't come. So I was just, I brought that little icon that the one that we saw there um, that on the screen, I brought that icon to her. But um, my friend um, Claudio Pere is supposed to deliver this thing, but you know, the pandemic hit and it didn't, it never made it. He still got it, um, but I'm hoping. And the, the reason for this is that Underhill wrote to this woman and I was just hot on the trail to get copies of this thing and get it into a proper yeah. archive at King's, uh, Underhill's materials are at King's College in London. Yeah. Um, but this has not transpired yet. Well, there's time yet. There's time yeah, there's yet. Time, right. <laughs> Got to go back to Italy, the yeah. <laughs> medicinal to the soul. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> thank you for your question. And thank you so much for your your presentation. It was really wonderful. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Dana, the uh, quote about the aim of prayer, I thought was outstanding. Oh, it is beautiful. Uh, did she have a particular type of prayer or meditation right. that she used to be in union with God? You know, she doesn't talk about that, but she writes a piece on the varieties of prayer. And she said, never dismiss never dismiss the prayers of the church, you know, like the Our Father and, and the Eucharistic prayers, never dismiss it, you will need that. Um, and then she goes, what she calls uh, the prayer of quiet, which I would see as more contemplative and receiving the love of God, you know, receiving the love of God. Do you, do you recall me, I ask? Do you recall, you know, I noticed that kind of later in her life, she was fond of the um, adoration, communion, and cooperation, you know, which yes, uh, right, right. In my experience goes back to Cardinal Beirut and Jean-Jacques yes. Oh, French, you, French you have read it. You've read it. Yes, adoration, um, attachment, and cooperation. Cooperation, Those, yeah. yeah. And by cooperation, she means being, transmitting the love of God through the person. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jean-Jacques Ollier also had a 
another rendition of that. He would say, adoration is like Jesus before my eyes. Uh, uh, communion is Jesus in my heart. And cooperation is Jesus in my hands. Oh. oh. Isn't that beautiful in a way? Beautiful. And that beautiful. was kind of like, uh, she uses that a lot, I think, in her later yeah. writings. Right. You mentioned she tries to dem democratize mysticism. And I think this was one way. Yes. She right. was maybe trying to do that. Right. And, the, and see... The focus on Underhill has largely been, you know, as a proponent of mysticism, but, you know, this other work of, of democratizing and offering retreats and yes. care of souls, people just have dismissed that. These two pieces belong together. Oh, absolutely. I could it, agree more. But, you know, uh, it, it's a tragedy because it shows the great uh, expansiveness of her spirit, I think. Speaking of Jesus in our hands, what is this? Is this a cat up here? This Peg Bartell. Oh, I guess I can't. It's got blue eyes, too. <laughs> this is my latest spiritual guru. He has taught me the love of God <laughs> that Beautiful. exists in all creatures. Yes. <laughs> So, anything else? Belisa? Dana. Yes. Dana, yes, thank you. Yes. There's, there's thank nothing you. more wonderful, not, it's, it's just, yes, it's, it's so much about the wonderful things that you know and can share, but your passion for, for her and her story and what she brings to the world is what you bring to us. So I oh. think we are all grateful for, are for that. Grateful. Well, I'm passionate about her. There's, <laughs> we, we picked that up. <laughs> you know, the other thing is that no one has really, well, there is a person working on this now of really exploring her final uh, vocation as a pacifist. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's a controversial thing, obviously, but it is, you know, it is central to the Christian yeah. tradition. Yeah, and um, she says, not everybody has that vocation. Yeah. They have other vocations, but it is a legitimate vocation. And during, you know, during the Iraq war and um, she was a great, solace to me and yeah. all of that so she's yeah. she's a friend over many years and she can be your friend too she's there for the yeah. for the yeah. friendship you certainly made her our friend yeah. yes. good good sure. good, good. Yeah. okay sure. thank you yeah. thank you everybody for being with yeah. us and, if, and now we know that no matter where you may be you can be with us again so yeah. let thank us you, know Lisa. thank you so much wonderful right. yeah. thank oh, you it's a pleasure thank take you. care everybody bye-bye bye-bye